back from a trip filming cinematic FPV one-shots with the DJI Avada. This is my first Cine Whoop, and in this video I wanted to let you guys know whether the Avadas are good drones to look at for doing this kind of work, and whether you should still consider getting the original Avada, especially now that the Avada 2 is on the market. So let's get into it. So I first got into flying FPV years ago with a little toy grade uh, Tiny Whoop. It was an Inductrix FPV Plus, and I got really proficient flying that around the house and even some outside doing some basic aerobatics because it did have an acro mode. So that's how I got familiar kind of with the FPV concept. But this year I got the opportunity to do some professional FPV work at campgrounds. So here's a story of how that came about. So going back years and years, I've had a relationship with the owner of a company, Campground Studios. His name is Brian, and they do video production and web development in the camping industry for different campground clients. So I've known him pretty much all my life, basically, and he knew I was into drones, and he had an idea for a new drone video product to bring into the camping world, and he wondered if I might like to participate. So basically, I don't know, I've had this vision for something about like a year, year and a half, ever since I was inspired by a video I saw on YouTube. And basically telling the story of a campground and what they have to offer, purely from a drone's perspective, the ability to fly in tight spaces and tell very interesting stories. So imagine a shot where you go into an RV, out the door, into the store, taking you through the pool and, and just in kind of this intricate flight pattern. So I was excited at the possibility of being able to bridge the gap between what I'd done for fun with drones, just flying around my house, and what I could do professionally. I got Part 107 certified the last year already, so I was all ready to go to work with Brian and help make this dream a reality. It's never been done in the industry. And this client that we're going to, which is Pride of America Campground, they said we want to be one of the first to do it. So they're, they're game, we're game, so we'll see what happens. So Brian decided to buy a drone to do this work with and having me as the primary pilot. So we did some shopping around and ended up settling on the DJI Avada, more on why in just a little bit, and had it shipped to my doorstep. So I got the drone and the uh, goggles too, the DJI goggles too, and the standard remote controller. I did not go with one of the bundles that they offer because all of those come with some form of the motion controller, which is not what I was interested in. Yes, it's cool, but it's not really what you want for doing cinematic FPV stuff. Everything was really pretty straightforward to get set up, so that evening, I took it out for its first flight. All right, so I just took the brand new DJI Avada out for its first little spin, and it went without mishap, staying in the normal and sport modes, which have auto leveling. This has a lot of unrealized potential that I am not dipping into just yet because I don't want to crash it just now, though I know this will be crashed probably a whole lot in its life. Right off the bat, what stood out to me the most was just how easy this drone is to fly. DJI has done a fantastic job at making the Avada line very approachable for anyone familiar with flying a standard, you know, typical video drone like a Mavic or a Mini Series or something like that. Because this flies exactly like one of those drones, the only difference being that you are wearing goggles on your face to fly it. So that takes a lot of getting used to if you're not familiar with FPV, but for me, since I had experienced it before, it was as simple as just putting on the goggles and flying. Though granted, these goggles are a little bit nicer, a little higher in than what I was using before. When you first get this drone, if you're someone who's flown FPV at all before, the first thing you're gonna hate is that, well, first of all, you're gonna hate the motion controller that comes with all the packages they offer, but if you get the RC or the FPV controller too here, you're not gonna like that the throttle stick self-centers. This is not the pro way to do it. Um, well, I guess I do know why it comes that way standard out of the box because it's, Again, like I'm saying, it's just like how the Mavics do it with their controllers, all the sticks center. So I appreciate what they're doing, making it approachable for the beginner and or the drone pilot who has flown other DJI drones. But after flying around just a little bit here, I can definitely tell that's the first thing I'm going to change, which they make it very easy to change, fairly easy. They include the tools to do it. You peel off the back of the uh, grip here and then adjust a couple of screws that change the spring tension on the stick. Definitely something that you're gonna wanna do when you get this drone. So you can totally fly in the normal or sport mode with the stick not centered, but 
With those, basically the, the stick is calibrated to be in the center as straight and level. So whether it's auto centering or not, you're gonna be hovering when you got it in the center. When you're in full acro mode, it's probably gonna be below center that you're gonna be hovering because it's got quite a bit of headroom to punch out. Something to keep in mind. like it that was so cool so this is kind of what I always dreamed of having the ability to do with an FPV drone back in the days when I was flying my little tiny Inductrix FPV plus was to be able to just have the power to pull out of dives and that kind of thing and wow it's really cool to have that freedom now in a drone So there are a lot of bits to grab when you want to go fly. You got to get the drone, the batteries for the drone, the controller, the goggles, the batteries for the goggles, the core that goes to the goggles, plus also a USB cable to connect to your phone because you got to connect to the DJI Fly app. If you don't have some kind of a bag, uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely would recommend something like that. One aftermarket accessory I would highly recommend you pick up is this little goggle battery clip right here. It's a, like a $15 accessory on Amazon. It just clips onto your goggle strap. It also comes with this shortened little uh, power cord so you don't have to have the little slinky cord that's included with the goggles dangling around down from your goggles. You already have the cord going to your phone so having that extra cord for the power is kind of inconvenient. A battery mount like this should totally be included with the goggles. DJI, if you're watching this, this needs to be included. At any rate, I'd really recommend getting one of these accessories. I'll put a link below for this one. To get set up for doing professional work with this drone, I needed to dial in the video settings on the camera to see what gave the best quality. Now the Avadas are a little different from a typical CineWoop because there's one camera on the drone that you fly through and that also records 4K video. So the first thing I did was I got some ND filters, which are gonna be essential for getting cinematic video. And then basically it was just going through all the video settings and seeing what gave the best quality. So here's what the footage looks like with completely auto settings like you see out of the box. And here's what it looks like with an ND filter and manual shutter speed so I can get the proper motion blur. Now this is 30 frames per second. And this shot is stabilized with Rocksteady, which is built into the camera. And this shot, I turned off Rocksteady so I would have the gyro data recorded, and I stabilized it after the fact with gyro flow. Now what you may be seeing a little bit of too is the fact that this video is in 24 frames per second, this video that I posted on YouTube, but this footage from the drone is in 30. So what happens when you have mismatched frame rates is your editor drops frames out of the video and you end up with a little bit of stutteriness. So it is a bummer that this drone can't shoot in 24 frames per second, and that's been a complaint from the beginning of the Avada line coming out. Neither the original Avada nor the Avada 2 can shoot in 24, so there's no difference there. But for me, it's not like a huge deal breaker because for any exclusively FPV video, like a one-shot kind of video, I can just deliver in 30 frames per second, which is fine to me. I'm not a purist, like I have to have everything in 24. That's gonna be a problem for some people, but for me, it's okay. And for any video where I'm using a snippet of FPV footage in a 24 frames per second timeline, in most cases, I can just slow the footage down to 80% so that the viewed frames matches the timeline, and that works pretty well. Or last resort, we just have drop frames in our video like you saw in that little test. That's how I kind of see it, so to me, it's not a huge deal. So what I ended up doing was shooting literally everything in 60 frames per second and decently like which is the flat color profile. 60 frames per second just gives me a little more flexibility in post to speed things up and slow things down and make it look smooth still. Plus it was a more comfortable flying experience because your live view camera and your recording camera are seeing the same frames per second because it's the same camera. So flying at 30 frames per second it feels like you have a little less response time kind of than flying at 60. So it just feels a little smoother flying at 60 frames per second. And then for the color profile choice, even if you don't have a desire to do some sort of creative fancy color grade in post, I still would recommend you shoot in decently like because the sharpness and kind of mid-tone detail is toned back a little bit so the footage looks a lot more cinematic to me, less action camera-y, looks much more pleasing. And besides that, it seems that the compression is improved on the 10-bit footage instead of the standard 8-bit, so I think it is objectively the better image. 
I also turned the ISO to auto so we could make some necessary adjustments for different lighting conditions because I was going through, you know, in, indoors to outdoors and things like that. And I left the image stabilization off because I was going to stabilize after the fact in post with Gyroflow. Uh, Gyroflow is a software that you can use to stabilize footage that has gyro data recorded to the video file. If you'd like to see some more content about that, leave a comment below. So with all these preparations and figuring out complete, it was time to hop on a plane to Wisconsin with Brian to go film at some campgrounds. I worked with Brian at several different campground locations doing a lot of different kinds of work, but one of the primary objectives was shooting these FPV one takes and they went really well. You know, there were some aspects of them that we couldn't really figure out and know for sure until actually on location. So there was still some figuring out to do, but we were able to iron out some techniques that kind of worked for what we were trying to create. And in the end, we were able to pull off the campground one take concept and bring that idea to reality, which was really rewarding to see it come together. And also, since we had the FPV drone along, we incorporated some first person view footage into some other video projects we were working on. Because kind of like maybe 15 years ago when drones were new or consumer drones were new and you would have a drone shot in a video, it just elevated that video to put it on another level. It just was so unique. And it's kind of the same today with an FPV drone because it is still unique having that perspective, having that footage incorporated into some kind of video production just puts it on a different level and adds a little bit of extra spice, which is pretty cool. And now I'm back home and the drone actually survived, believe it or not, which is something I wanna to touch on real quick because I'm actually pretty impressed by the durability of the Avada, especially considering the fact that it's really kinda heavy, like it's a dense little drone and it can go like 60 miles an hour. So talking about a lot of inertia there, there have definitely been some significant crashing incidents, as well as a couple of incidents involving some moisture and it survived all of it. Now I will say, because I had already flown an FPV drone before, I didn't have a lot of the beginner crashes that most pilots would have. My crashes were mostly, you know, pushing the limits and running into things and stuff like that, rather than just not knowing how to control it and crashing. So if you were coming into this as your first ever FPV drone, your crashes might start to stack up a little bit more and count against your durability rating. But regardless, I can say it's definitely very durable. And if you wanna check out the full one shot that I helped create for Brian's campground client, you can check out the link below. This gives you a little bit better idea of what kind of stuff this drone is capable of capturing. So should you get a DJI Avada one or two over a traditional Cinemoop? The answer really depends on what your goals are. In this situation, we didn't want a hobby for an FPV drone. We wanted something that would get the job done, no questions asked, that was all self-contained, everything included, and just super easy to get up and going, and we wouldn't have to think about any tuning or anything like that. Is it the best Cinewoop all the way around? Probably not, but I can say after going on this trip, you can absolutely do professional work with the Avadas. They're capable of doing cinematic FPV one-shots, as well as real estate fly-throughs, things like that. Filming BMX stuff, you know, whatever you need to do professionally, you can pull it off with a DJI Avada. They aren't just for fun or just for beginners. I also didn't have any issues when flying inside, which I know a lot of people reported having connection issues and the drone would freak out when flying inside. That wasn't something I experienced at all, which obviously being able to fly indoors is kind of a must for any of those applications I just talked about. <laughs> but there are some drawbacks of an Avada versus a typical FPV drone, again, depending on what you want to get out of it. Basically, I would say I got what I was expecting and I'm happy with getting a Nevada. But some reasons that you might not want to are that they are kind of smart and have a lot of kind of techy features. And if you don't want that in your drone, you should probably look elsewhere. A good example of something that I ran into that I found a little bit annoying, and that is it doesn't have a dumb auto level mode. So by that, I mean, I would like to see a mode that is basically acro mode but with 
auto level and bank limits. You can see with the Avada, anytime you switch it into an auto leveling mode, it also turns on the down facing sensors, which keep you from running into the ground, which is a good thing, um, but it won't let you go within like two feet of the ground or so. So if you're coming over a building or over trees, it can also mess with your descent a little bit and kind of make it wonky because it wants to see a clear path before letting you come down. I ran into that a few times and sort of messed up a couple of flight paths. So things like that come with the territory of a techie and beginner friendly drone that's easy to get into and start flying. But once you're wanting to open it up and push the limits, you might find those things kind of annoying. Also a weird thing in how the control is, the yaw axis, when you use that control, introduces a little bit of bank, which kind of helps you make coordinated turns, I think is the idea. But if you're used to a traditional FPV drone, this kind of seems weird because it's adding in bank control when you aren't moving the bank control stick. <laughs> it's doing it all by itself. That being said, I kind of got used to it pretty quickly and it wasn't a huge deal, but still a little strange. So if you don't like techie stuff, probably shouldn't get an Avada. Now you might also think that the Avadas are more expensive than a traditional CineWoop, but this isn't necessarily true. Yes, the batteries are substantially more expensive for the Avadas. It's like 130 bucks for a replacement battery, though I will say it's very impressive the battery life you get out of that one battery. But the drone itself isn't that much more expensive than most of your pre-built CineWoops, and those still need a controller, they still need goggles, and you probably also need a GoPro to mount on those as well. So by the time it's all said and done, the price point isn't that big of a factor in determining which one to get. So should you get an Avada over some other kind of Cinewoop? I'm gonna leave that answer ultimately up to you. If you're willing to have a little bit more of a project, maybe do some tuning, things of that nature, or if you're already into FPV drones, the Avada is probably not for you. You should probably look elsewhere. But if you want something that flies just like a Mavic, is super easy to get into, and can also grow with you and you can do professional work with, the Avada series is a great option. Now, is the original Avada still worth getting now that the version two has come out? So the original Avada had several things about it that people complained about, which warranted a version two coming out to make some improvements. But in my opinion, nothing really revolutionary changed from the one to the two. Like it didn't suddenly shoot in 24 frames per second or anything like that. A lot of the complaints with the original had to do with the SD card placement, which is admittedly dumb. It's really silly what they did. It feels like an afterthought. But in working with this drone for a month, I really never once was like, this is a total deal breaker. I can't live with this. People complained about the noise level on the Avada 1. But again, this wasn't any problem for me. I wasn't flying for prolonged periods indoors which is the only time that it really would make any difference. There are some camera upgrades on the Avada 2. It's got a little better low light performance and it can shoot in log color profile now. But my opinion is, yes, the original is still a viable drone to consider if you can get a good deal on it. There's quite a few on the market still at a reasonable discount, either new or refurbished. So if you can find a decent deal, I definitely consider it. All of that being said, pretty much everything I talked about in this video should be applicable to both drones, especially when it comes to doing professional work with them and stuff. So no matter which one you're shopping for, I hope you guys found this informative. My little venture into cinematic FPV has been a fun one and it's only just getting started. So I hope you guys will follow along and subscribe for more filmmaking videos on this channel. And next you should check out this video. I don't even know which video this is. YouTube just thinks you'll like it. And I guess YouTube knows you better than I do, maybe? Well, hope so. You should watch this and find out. I'll see you guys over there.